Hi, this is Mary Hood again. Uh, if you haven't seen me before, I'm sometimes known as the Relaxed Tone Schooler. I've been around the movement uh, since the 80s for a very long time. Uh, author of such books as The Relaxed Home School, A Joyful Home Schooler, and the newer one on Amazon, um, The Relaxed Home Schooler Rides Again. It's a picture of me on a horse. It was staged. <laughs> I do love horses, but I haven't actually ridden one in a while. Anyway, today we're going to talk about learning, specifically learning styles and the environment that you're going to have in order to create an, uh, a situation where your individual children are going to do the best learning they possibly can. A lot of people shy away from this topic because somehow it sounds sort of like you have to be a trained educator or study for hours and hours and hours. That's not true. The only thing is you have to be aware of what works for your child and what doesn't work. And believe me, children have a way of letting you know what works for them and what doesn't. Um, so the first thing I want to discuss is sort of you know, what we mean by learning. When does learning take place? And of course, we all know that the very best type of learning is self-learning. It's In some ways, it's really the only genuine learning is when you're learning on your own. Uh, naturally, parents have a role to play in helping to uh, facilitate that and to certainly teach certain things to their children. But nevertheless, real learning comes from within. All right. Now, that happens best when it's something that the child is themselves motivated in and they're doing on their own because they're naturally going to do it in the way that works best for them. And of course, we all know some kid who's maybe super into birds, you know, or something. And that's just, that's all they want to do. They want to get up in the morning and they want to do the bird feeder and they want to look at the bird house and they want to get out the bird identification book. Maybe some other kids, it's baseball. You know, that was one of my sons, which is super into baseball. And he just, he knew all the stats and all the players, you know, and, and everything. And there are so many things they're learning from things like that, even if to us, it might not look educational at all times. But that kind of self-learning is always the very best. Now, what parents want to do is to create an environment that's as close to that as possible. So you have to think about things like motivation, like goals. Is it the child setting the goals? As they get older, it's better, of course, when they are the ones doing it. If you're the one setting the goals, how can you get them to buy into it? You know, every piece of learning doesn't have to be fun all the time. But especially when you're beginning a topic, the more fun it can be, the more chance that they're really going to engage. Uh, one, one example of this that I remember is that one of my daughters was not into math at all. Um, and so it was never going to be a fun, self-motivated kind of thing in that way. But once she started heading, getting closer to college and realizing she needed to de do decent on the SAT to do math, then at least her own goal started to kick in, all right? And then, even if it wasn't fun all the time, it was still something that she had bought into and said, this is what I want to do. And at that point, I had to be sensitive to learning style, uh, which we're going to talk about in a minute. But, but uh, you know, the things that I already had around the house were not going to work for her. She was just, she was a different kind of learner than my older son was, and he, of course, was the one that I had bought all the materials for. So one of the things you have to understand about learning styles is sometimes you're going to have to trash some materials. You're going to have to get rid of some of your own expectations and so forth. And another thing is to understand is that we tend to teach the way we learn. All right. We tend to want to set up the environment that we would work well in. An example of this is the concept of noise. You know, some people just can't learn. They can't focus unless it's an absolutely silent, pristine environment, sort of like a library, at least the way libraries used to be. Um, and there are other people, believe it or not, that need to have some music or something going on in the background in order to learn. And when you're the parent who needs the silence, it's very hard to understand your child's need for noise in the background. Um, it, it similarly, you know, some kids might really, really do best if they're sitting outside on the front porch reading a book. Uh, some of you know Chris Davis, his famous picture of him uh, where his child is, is laying on his back on a horse reading a book. You know, so some kids just learn better doing things, being active. Some people learn better uh, by listening. Some people learn better by, by looking at things. Again, some people want it noisy. Some people want it quiet and all that sort of thing. And the idea is you have to start to gradually, and this isn't all going to happen at once. I know that. But you have to gradually start thinking, how do you learn best? Then notice that that's what you're going to be trying to recreate. And then how does each of your children learn best? All right.
Now, the best way I know to get a quick handle on this, first of all, there's, there's more than one way of classifying learning styles. Right now, I'm going to talk about visual, auditory, and kinesthetic, but there's other ways of categorizing learning styles. Again, the important thing is to recognize that everybody learns a little differently, all right? And you have to figure out to what extent uh, your child learns one way or the other in order to connect with them better. Because again, you will try to teach them the way that works best for your learning style, and that, that may connect well with one child and not with another one, and then you start thinking you're a failure or something, and that's not what's going on. You're just not connecting because of the whole learning style issue. So to begin with, picture your child sitting next to you on the couch, all right? One kid is going to be sitting there like this, you know, leaning back, staring off into space, looking like they have nothing on their minds at all as far as what you're reading to them. And yet later, it will turn out, yes, they were in, in fact paying attention and listening. All right? This child is the one that tends to be the auditory learner, the kid who's taking it in through his ears. All right? Many, many men are auditory. Now, this isn't an absolute. There are also women that are, and, you know, it, but it just tends to be that a lot of men are auditory, that they learn through their ears. Uh, if you remember back to your own days in high school or college, you probably remember the, the couple of men that were, or boys that were sitting in the back, just kind of staring off into space and not ever taking any notes and anything, and then you couldn't figure out why they did well in the class in the long run. But it's because they were taking it all in through their ears, all right? These, by the way, are the ones who are going to learn very well and quickly with phonics. When, they, when the mature, maturation kicks in, the readiness is there, and they're also learning auditor, or auditorily, they will quickly pick up the beginning of learning, of, of learning to read. However, because English really isn't a phonetic language, if you look at it, how many ifs, ands, and buts, and, and different things, and because it, it came together as a mishmash of some of the Romance languages and the Germanic and the Celtic languages, because of all that, it's really not phonetic at all. So ultimately, those kids may struggle later on with spelling. And if you'll notice, a lot of men have trouble with spelling. And one of the reasons is that they're still trying to spell everything phonetically. There used to be a book called Genius at Work, G-N-Y-S at W-R-K. It was the, from a, a, a sign when some little girl put up on her, on her door when she was working. So Genius at Work, that's an example of phonetic spelling. And of course, there are many men, especially again, and some girls who misspell all the way through their lives, unless at some point they actually sit down and learn how to spell as a separate part of a curriculum somewhere, because that's, that's their phonetic learning style. So again, a phonetic or auditory learning style will help them to read early on. Later on, it can be a problem and even lead to spelling difficulties that need to be corrected. Now, the second type of kid is the one who has to sit right next to you. If, you're, if she's one person away, she's upset with you, all right? They, they like books that have pictures in them. Th they're going to be looking at the pictures. They're going to be looking at the, at the print and so forth, you know, and they always want to look at it, and they want to be right there. That's the one that tends to be a visual learner. Many, many women are visual learners. There's a few ways you can tell if you have that tendency. One is if you're, if when you're being asked to spell a word or something, if you find yourself writing it out in the air, that makes you tend to be visual. Um, if, if your husband is explaining something to you and you grab it away from him and say, let me see that, all right, that's a tendency to be visual, all right? Visual kids, um, they will learn to read more slowly because, and, and if they're strongly visual, they may really, really, really not be able to understand or get phonics, all right? One of my kids was like that, just couldn't get phonics, never could, all right? Um, but, the, you know, I'm, again, there's, there can be a mix of things here, so it's not all or nothing. But I'm just saying that some kids who are visual learners essentially need to memorize the English language, if you will. They look at shapes. They look at, at a ver variety of things. And you can try to help them gradually with, with talking about the sounds of letters and so forth. And that. But it's going to be very, very difficult for some of those kids to learn that way. Um, that's why there's no one right way to teach reading. In, in, like in a school setting, they always think, okay, now we know what we're doing. And then they use that style, but it always leaves somebody out, all right? So some kids who are highly visual are not going to get phonics. They're going to want to learn by basically memorizing the English language. My, my daughter, who was very much like that, uh, she, she got hung up on one book. I still remember it was called Downy Duck Grows Up. It was an old uh, 
reader, you know, uh, from, from many years ago in the elementary schools when they had that. And she just re read that book over. I wanted me to read the book to her over and over and over and over and basically essentially memorized that book and then went on to the next book and the next book and the next book, all right? And eventually became a great reader, a fantastic writer, a great communicator, wound up with an English degree from college, you know. <laughs> so obviously it worked for her, but it took her a little longer and she just really struggled with the phonics part of that, all right? Now, the third type of kid, and this is often a boy, but again, not necessarily. Um, this is the kid who you're reading to either him or her or a group of kids on the couch, but they're over there in the corner playing with their trucks, building with Legos and all that sort of thing. If you say to that kid, okay, now you've got to come over here and sit on your hands, the kid will be sitting there bouncing, you know, <laughs> can't take it, why is mom doing this to me, looking at the clock, whatever. This tends to be the kinesthetic child, the one who really needs to move while they're, while they're learning. You know, and, and so, and, and like I said, some kids actually have to have music or other things going on so that they can, it's almost like they need two things to focus on before they can focus on anything, if, if that makes any sense at all. Now, many people are a mix, and I'm a really good example of this. I have all three of them in me, all right? Um, one thing I, I notice about myself is when I try to memorize things, I've got to have a physical component. For example, when I memorize the books of the Bible, I do it on my fingers, you know. I, ta I, I think about, so when I get to, you know, the, the books of wisdom, you know, the books of poetry or, or the, the books of history or whatever, and I go like this as I'm going through them. Okay, there are 12 of these and 5 of these and 5 of these and 12 of these. And I do that, and to this day, when I think about the books of the Bible, I do that, you know, Genesis, Exodus, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, five books of history, and you know, go on. And I do it, and I use both my hands. <laughs> this isn't the same as when kids are counting on their fingers in math. It's a little bit different. But the idea is, I, I apparently, as the, person, the kind of person, especially with memory work, that I have to have some component of using my body in order to trigger whatever uh, memory cells that I'm using or whatever. Uh, on the other hand, I also have a lot of visual in me. I do the uh, writing my writing things in the air like that. Um, when I was learning how to type many years ago, I would type with my fingers in the air. Um, I also have some auditory. I'm the type of person who can sit there and just listen to things. And I've had to be very careful when I was a speaker. You know, I was a speaker for many years. And again, you tend to speak just like you tend to teach the way that you learn. And so I frequently would not want to have the videos, the visuals, excuse me, up on the up on the board and so forth. And I had to train myself that some people just really need that, all right? And by the way, the visual people also often take notes, scrupulous notes, all right? And you'll often find that the, uh, the uh, auditory ones are not taking notes at all, all right? Now, whether or not you go back and read those notes later, that's a whole other issue, all right? For example, uh, kinesthetic people have a very hard time sitting through an hour or two, two hour long lecture. If they're going to attempt to at all as adult women, I often see women out there um, uh, knitting or crocheting or do some, doing something like that. If they're there with nothing else to do, they'll be taking scrupulous notes. They'll be doing all, they'll be doodling. I do that lots, you know, doodle, little, make little things and everything. I will never look at those notes again in my life. <laughs> <laughs> because when I take notes, they're really not to look at later. They're to kind of solidify it inside my own mind and to keep my body doing something so I can keep listening to it. So just keep in mind that learning styles are very complicated, but all you need to really do is pay close attention to your children and be willing to make the shifts. You know, most of those of you who are new, you're going to be focusing first at what curriculum you're getting. And it's going to be so much focused on that that you're almost not going to notice for a few months that it's not working for one of your kids. All right. So just be sensitive from the very beginning. You know, might this kid need to be doing something outside? Might it be better? You know, it, th and like I said, they'll let you know. If the kid is saying, C can I do this on the porch, mom? There's probably a reason for that. You know, can I turn on my music while I'm doing this? Well, okay, but then you need to go back in your back room because your, your little sister needs to have quiet when she's doing her work and so forth. So you need to be sensitive to it. You need to be constantly asking yourself a lot of questions, including what would 
what would I do if it was just me? In other words, trying to, to isolate your own learning style because that will be your teaching style and that teaching style may or may not connect, in which case you have to be flexible enough to try to make a shift. All right, that's it for today. I hope that helps some of you. Um, I haven't really got a specific uh, place where I, where I wrote about this. Sometimes you and I, I have little guidebooks and things that I can refer you to. But in, in a lot of this, I just, I winged it like you will. You know, I just kind of learned about it a little at a time and gradually figured out what works. And, and, and remember, your kids all are all individual. My kids grew up to be extreme individuals. If you met any one of my five kids today, they range in age from 30, they're just turning 30 to 43, uh, you wouldn't even know they, they were uh, <laughs> related to each other because they're just very individual kids. And that, to me, is one of the beauty things about homeschooling is that you can do that. But in order to do that, you have to get over this idea that the curriculum is telling you to do it this way, so I've got to do it this way, you know, that I'm a school and doggone it. The kids have to be learning in a particular manner and no, you can't be out on the porch and all that sort of thing. So you, it's just a mo mostly a matter of flexibility on your part to make this all succeed. Thanks a lot. See you again.